Thank you, Margie, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeremy Shaver. I am a member of the ADL Mountain States Regional Staff. On behalf of the ADL Central Division, I welcome you to the fourth and final installment in our 2022 speaker series. The speaker series is a collaborative effort of the ADL Austin, Heartland, Michigan, Midwest, Mountain States, Southwest, and Texoma regions. Wherever you live, we are thankful that you are joining us today. We thank American Airlines for sponsoring this, uh, this year's series. We also thank the many community partners for their support of today's session. Our conversation today will focus on disability rights and the work to ensure persons with disabilities are treated fairly and justly in all aspects of society. As we enter the conversation, we remember that not all disabilities are visible, and we will do our best to keep that in mind today. We are pleased to have an excellent lineup of panelists. We are joined by Allison Butler, Director of the Division of Disability Rights at the City and County of Denver, Lex Frieden, educator, researcher, disability policy expert, and a co-author of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Lloyd Lewis, CEO of ARC Thrift Stores of Colorado, and Jennifer Phillips, President and CEO of Keshet in Chicago. Our moderator is Jillian Bonke, Director of Educational Programs for ADL's Central Division. Some reminders, if you have questions, uh, today we are using the chat feature, so please put your questions in the chat. As was mentioned, Spanish language translation is available using the globe icon, and we do have closed captioning enabled. ADL is a nonprofit 501c3 organization and takes no positions on behalf or in opposition to any candidate for office. With all that said, uh, Jillian, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to our panelists. I'm Jillian Bonke, ADL's uh, Director of Educational Programs in the Central Division, and I am looking forward to today's program. As I know, we have the opportunity to learn, and I'm honored to be among advocates and experts today on the panel who have agreed to share their time, their lived experiences, and their expertise with us. Um, really quickly, a little bit about ADL and who we are. ADL is a leading anti-hate organization founded in 1913 our timeless mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all is relevant as, as relevant today as the day that it was as the, as the day our founders created it. Um, we continue to fight hate in all forms um, we, and um, we use innovative partnership to drive impact. As an educator, I believe that the best advocates work to understand and conversations like the one we're about to have today will help us do just that. Um, we come to this conversation recognizing that so much work has been done and so much work still remains to ensure that persons with disabilities are treated fairly and justly in all aspects of society. Um, just to start us off, a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA. It was signed into law in 1990 and is the country's first significant step toward addressing the needs of citizens living with disabilities. The law tackles discrimination in the workplace by requiring employers to make reasonable accommodations for applicants or employees with disabilities. It also attempts to eliminate discrimination in the realm of local and state governments, privately owned businesses and commercial facilities. An important amendment was introduced in 2008 to address access related to telecommunications, the internet, television, and other digital services. So we're gonna start today with Lex. And Lex comes to us having worked with President George Bush to draft the Americans with Disabilities Act. And he's regarded as one of the co-authors of that critical piece of civil rights legislation. So Lex, my question for you as we kick our conversation off is, reflecting on the 32 years since the ADA became law, what are the most significant accomplishments or gains made for Americans with disabilities? What, what can we celebrate? Jillian, thank you. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate. And, and first of all, I want to thank you all for having me on this panel and note that uh, Jillian, uh, Jillian's father was one of the preeminent uh, advocates of the ADA and worked uh, uh, throughout his life to ensure full implementation of ADA. And I just want to honor Joe Bonke and also 
uh, Jillian's aunt, who was a physician and a wheelchair user and, and also a real uh, outstanding and preeminent advocate. So Jillian, you have a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of integrity here based on your own personal experience growing up with people who have dif disabilities and, and huge advocates. The ADA, when it was passed, really was a landmark piece of legislation. It was the first uh, law after the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, really to have a compelling impact on our society as far as rights and opportunities of people were concerned. And, and a couple of things about the ADA that I think are important as a foundation to note is that in the beginning, many people wanted to define ADA according to disability types and to uh, characteristics and to uh, diagnoses. And we fought very hard and, and won the fight to ensure that uh, disability was not defined on a basis of a certain impairment or diagnostic category, but it was simply defined on the basis of discrimination that could be attributed to someone making an understanding, having a belief of, or a perception that another person had a disability. And, and that's a powerfully impactful uh, statement right there. Uh, the day the ADA was passed, uh, it was um, probably the first day in the history of the world that people all over the world became uh, aware of discrimination on the basis of disability. CNN covered uh, the president's uh, speech on July 26, 1990, and it, it included uh, the ADA coverage in its international network. And on that day, ADA was the headlines in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and newspapers all over the world. So it, it has had, uh, from the very beginning, a tremendous impact. In our country, the first impact was on public transportation. And virtually overnight, people with disabilities had access to public transportation. Also on uh, uh, physical uh, accessibility, uh, buildings began building ramps all overnight and uh, widening bathroom doorways and ensuring access on aisles and shopping centers for people with disabilities. So the physical changes that have occurred as a result of the ADA have been profound and uh, we, we should all celebrate that. I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing, Lex, thank you. Um, and I wanna bring Allison into the conversation. Um, Allison has spent 25 years, her whole 25 year law career as a civil rights attorney with a focus on disability justice. Allison, my question for you is similar. What are the most significant advances in law since the, AD, since the ADA was passed? And are there significant lawsuits or legal victories that come to mind? Sure, and it's very hard to put it into like three minutes because this is amazing. Um, and let me just say thank you for having me. My mom used to work at the ADL, ADL Mountain States um, way back when, and to be here with, um, co-author of the ADA. When I do in-person trainings on disability justice stuff, every time I say ADA, everybody has to say, ah. So it is that amazing. It really is that amazing of a law. Um, and I guess I wanna mention five big things that have happened. There's there's many, many, but I think these are pretty significant. Um, you know, the right to stay alive, uh, the right to have a family, the right to live in the community, the right to have a job, and the right to order a pizza. And, uh, and I don't say those in any particular order, <laughs> but um, so the right to stay alive is, and this is still being debated in things, but um, it's really some of the legal victories An early legal victory, the ADA was passed in 1990. And in 1993, it came up when a woman in Virginia um, had a baby. And while she was pregnant, um, the baby was diagnosed with um, anencephaly. And um, they said that the baby would not live, um, babies don't live who have this uh, disease. And, but she did not want to abort the baby. She wanted to have her baby live. Um, and the baby was born had many functions, but 
I couldn't breathe well. Um, again, still knew it was going to be terminal. She wanted to keep her baby on the ventilator and the publicly funded hospital did not want to do so um, and sought to remove the ventilator. Um, so there was a lawsuit and she won in Ray Baby K. And they said that you can't go against the mother's wishes in this way and you can't um, choose to kill somebody because of their disability. So that's like the right to stay alive. Um, and then we get to the right to have a family. Um, the ADA really changed one major thing. And I worked for about a year and a half um, specifically in child welfare, dealing with disabilities and child welfare. And there's a lot of discrimination that still occurs. But in 1927, um, the United States Supreme Court decided a case of Buck v. Bell, and it involved a woman who had been, her mother had been institutionalized for what they believed was intellectual developmental disabilities. Um, uh, she was then, Carrie Buck was then born in the institution, and the institution was called the Virginia State Colony for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptics. Um, she was adopted out to a family, um, unfortunately had a sexual assault, and rather than have the um, stigma of that attached to the family, they sent Carrie back to live in the institution where she had a baby. When she had the baby, they went to sterilize her and they, she didn't want to be sterilized. Um, and she fought the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in 1927 said, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for their crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So they allowed Carrie Buck to be sterilized. Um, this was part of the eugenics movement, which obviously the ADL is very familiar with. Um, so that changed um, in 1990 when the ADA came into play and people could say, no, you can't sterilize people. You can't stop people from um, having children, even if those children are going to have disabilities. Um, and that became clear really only in 2015 when the Department of Justice put out a technical assistance document that said, hey, people with uh, disabilities uh, are allowed to be parents. You can't discriminate against them. You can't assume that they're not gonna be able to parent. You have to allow them to use their to use their village. If they use their village to live, they should use their village to be able to have a family. So that was really important um, decision. And there was a Sarah Gordon case out of Massachusetts that led to that technical assistance document. Um, and so that's really amazing. Um, live in the community. Uh, the Olmstead case, people may have heard it referred to as um, just Olmstead. The Olmstead decision, the United States Supreme Court in 1999 said a state is required to try to find to, to provide services in the community for people with disabilities so they don't have to live in institutions. Um, so we rely on Olmstead. Right now, Colorado is under some findings saying that we don't serve people with physical disabilities well enough and they end up in nursing homes unnecessarily. Um, so this is still something that is very, very active, a huge part of the ADA, um, the Olmstead decision. The lead plaintiff in that case just died a couple of weeks ago, but she really brought so much change to this, um, to this arena and allowing people to live in the community. Lloyd's gonna talk a lot more about employment, but there's lots of cases that have occurred. Um, and I think the 2008 amendments, when they changed what is the definition of disability and really made sure it was very broad, helped tremendously. Um, and so legal victories in this are that you have to consider leave as an accommodation. You have to engage in the interactive process. So you have to talk to somebody about what they may need in order to be on the job site. You can't assume, you can't say, no, that doesn't work for me. You have to engage in the interactive process. Um, I think that's really big. And then lastly, ordering a pizza. And it may sound like a joke, but there was a case of, of Domino's when um, a blind man said, I can't, your, your website isn't accessible. I can't use my screen reader. It's not working. You tell me I can make a phone Call. I'm on hold for 45 minutes. This is inappropriate. So that was a United States Supreme Court said, yeah. Um, at the time they said, because, and that was 2019, because the website is attached to a brick and mortar store, yes, your website has to be completely accessible. The Department of Justice has since said, it doesn't even matter if you're attached to a brick and mortar store. If you're engaged in commerce, your website needs to be accessible. So those are kind of like in this very short period of time, just kind of all around. Um, and then I guess the last thing, I do wanna mention one last thing, is it really changed um, the ability to have obvious discrimination. I think we can all agree that if you walked up to a restaurant and in the window, it had a sign that said, for whites only, 
we would say, what, are you kidding me? And then we would call the news and it would be this like giant thing. But if you walk up to a restaurant and there's a set of stairs in the front, we don't do that. And it's saying for people who can walk upstairs only. And the ADA has changed that. And it's still, there are still places that are, you know, having to make changes 32 years later. But I think it's really telling that in some ways we've accept, we completely say this discrimination isn't allowed. And in other ways, we're still working on it. Um, and, and I just want you to think about that when you go to, when you go and you know, about your daily life. I, I really appreciate that overview in those five areas because I think that it's not top of mind for everyone. Um, Lloyd, Lloyd is the CEO and president of the ARC Thrift Stores of Colorado, one of the state's largest employers of persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. He's an advocate on a mission to promote a new way to think about inclusion and diversity. We appreciate you being here with us today, Lloyd. And I, our question to start us off is, um, quality employment opportunities for people with disabilities continue to lag. What have you, um, what have you seen, what gains have you seen made? And can you tell us any success stories related to your work at um, ARC Thrift Stores? And you're, you're muted, we've got to unmute real quick. Thank you, Jillian. It's it's an honor to be part of this panel, and I, and it's just a privilege to be on with all of these wonderful panelists that we've assembled for this conversation. Um, so on employment, uh, a lot of gains have been made since ADA was implemented, and thank you, Lex, and others for making that happen. Uh, but in the world of employment, we're still a very, very long way from where we need to be. So, you know, employ, unemployment for people with disabilities ranges from 50 to 80 percent. Imagine any other part of our population encountering such a high unemployment rate. There would be a hue and an outcry that would just be continuous and, and, uh, and dramatic. Uh, so there still is a very long ways to go. Uh, there have been gains. Uh, uh, you know, a number of large companies have declared and implemented initiatives to employ people with disabilities, providing accessible environments, assistive technology, uh, eliminating stereotypes, services, systems, and policies that involve people with disabilities in employment. Uh, 3M is one such company that's declared its commitment to employing people with disabilities, creating employee resource groups, uh, including something called Disability Awareness Network, which describes disabilities as strengths. Uh, Salesforce has declared their intent to become the largest employer of people with disabilities in the country. Uh, they've joined something called the Valuable 500, calling for 500 of the most influential businesses to include disability on their leadership agenda. Walgreens is another such employer who has uh, designed facilities all across the country. I visited one in Anderson, South Carolina. Uh, using technology and employing, uh, you know, a very high percentage of that workforce uh, with disabilities. And on the federal and state side, under the Department of Labor, as an example, the Office of Disability Employment Policy has created a program called Employment First, working with states and federal programs to encourage employment of people with disabilities. So there are encouraging signs but it still remains a very significant area of discrimination. I mean, once hired, you are legally uh, compelled to provide accommodations, but you're not required to hire people right now. So it results in a very high percentage of unemployment. Uh, and at my company, uh, as I mentioned, one of the largest companies with nearly 2000 employees, when I started in 2005, we had 10 employees with intellectual and developmental disabilities, considered significant disabilities. Uh, I have been fortunate uh, to hire over 400 such individuals during my tenure here. Uh, we're now one of the largest employers of people with IDD uh, in our state. And prior to me, uh, people thought it would be too costly, uh, too complicated, too difficult to do. Uh, we have we've had 14 record years since hiring these employees. Uh, they helped us get through the COVID year, and we we have continued record years post COVID. Uh, I believe they are a significant part of the workforce of any company, 
lower lower rates of you know turnover, very committed to their jobs, uh, wanting to contribute on teams, and companies across America who don't hire people with disabilities are missing out on a very significant part of the population, particularly during a period of great resignation. So in my mind, uh, the highest rate of unemployment in America is something we should all be talking about and working on to address. Absolutely, that rate, that's incredible, 50 to 80% unbelievable rates, but we appreciate what you're doing to, to make sure that people with disabilities get employees at our thrift stores. Um, Jennifer is an accomplished special education professional with more than 29 years of experience in the classroom, rec uh, recreational and residential settings. She is regularly called upon by campuses and community centers for consultations and leading trainings about inclusion. Um, Jennifer, Kesha got started in um, 1982, 10 years before the ADA became law. Um, what do you think are the most significant gains made for children with disabilities and their families, especially in religious life, but beyond? Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about how, you know, 10 years before ADA was passed, I think uh, our group of parents who really wanted a place in the community um, for their kids, and they were not allowed in the community. And so, you know, them at that time saying, this is what we want, um, and getting to the place where ADA was passed, it really um, is amazing, right? Because they were not allowed in schools with their siblings. They were not able to um, always access transportation to get to school or to other places. And I think when ADA passed, uh, we saw a change in our children being able to participate in the greater community and to be inclusive with everyone. Um, you know, we noticed a lot of that even in our, our camp programs, right, where kids were segregated in camp programs because there was not uh, the ability for them to be transported with their peers or their siblings. And so there was a big change then that it wasn't just about necessarily, you know, oh, should we do it or not? Um, they had to. And so people's mindsets changed. And we saw a lot of that. I think we saw a lot of that also um, when you talk about in our religious communities that, you know, children weren't allowed in synagogues or churches. Um, you know, they were, they were um, not accessible. Um, there's been a big change in that. And I think there was a slow, a slow start after ADA. I think only in the last 10 years, to be very honest, there's been a little bit more of a push to make it accessible for everyone. It used to be that people couldn't even get up on um, to the, uh, the front of church churches or synagogues <laughs> to be able to be um, um, in front of everyone. And I also think um, there is a, you know, a piece of uh, even um, park districts, there were not um, the access for children with disabilities to be able to participate in programs, after school programs or um, art programs or other classes. And so that really helped change the ability um, for things to be accessible for all children. And, you know, I I do still believe we have a long way to go, um, even though things have changed there are still a lot of barriers. Um, I know that Lori talked a lot about, you know, the uh, workplace, um, but there's still barriers even in schools. Um, and so continuing to make sure um, that all places are accessible so that there doesn't need to be a choice where you need to go, um, that you should go to your home school, that you could go to a park district and participate if you want to go to a certain camp, um, that you're able to do that. And so I, I do think though uh, it was in 1982, very, very different than when in 1990 things changed. Um, we still have a little bit of a ways to go. Um, and we're still encouraging other camps and other schools and churches and synagogues to be able um, to welcome everyone in and make things accessible for everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm, I'm hearing loudly, we have some things to do. We have a way to go. I'm looping back around to Lex. Um, Lex, what do you see are the biggest struggles, the greatest opportunities, if you will, in the continued fight for access and inclusion for persons with disabilities? Well, I, I mean, we've already heard panelists' uh, comments about what the 
challenges are here. I think employment uh, probably falls at the top of the list. I'll mention that in the last two years with COVID, uh, I think we've opened doors to people that were not open before because uh, people with disabilities for a long time uh, who had stamina issues, who may not have been able to uh, sit or stand at work for after 10 hours a day, would be able to work from home. And, and employers did not like the idea of people doing telework. Uh, but we broke through that barrier during COVID. And now I think employers can no longer use uh, the absence of people in the workplace physically as an excuse not to hire them. And I think they've actually been uh, fairly aggressive in some areas employing people with disabilities using telework since COVID. Uh, the, the other thing I would say about that is that people with disabilities have become, begun to be more uh, self, better self-advocates and to, to basically sell themselves to employer in a constructive kind of way. I think the employer resource groups are important. And I think employers who include people with disabilities in their diversity training, diversity outreach, and diversity programs are probably making a big step forward for their own uh, business and certainly for people with disabilities. Uh, the biggest issue right now is enforcement. Uh, the, the, many, many complaints out there, but people don't know how to deliver complaints in a way that they will be successfully dealt with. And I want to say to anyone on this call, if you go to a restaurant and you see steps, if you go to uh, a store and, and the public bathroom is not accessible, if you go to a place and see discrimination in any form uh, on the basis of disability, if you see people parking in disabled parking spots who obviously don't need them, if you see delivery people using those spots, make a complaint and not to the business, make the complaint to the Department of Justice or the Office of the U.S. Attorney or in the case of employment to the EEOC. Those complaints are effectively dealt with. And that's the only way we're gonna clean up these little spots of discrimination is by effectively using the complaint process. The other thing I would say is that we have 76 million baby boomers out there. Most of them and if we're going to age in place, we need to have accessible services in the home divide, uh, provided by community-based agencies. So we really need to work on extending Olmstead to home and community-based support services. People with disabilities, older people who are becoming disabled need to be able to get assistance in the home. And th th there's a balance there between provision and ADA enforcement. I think uh, at this point in time, we need more providers to step forward and begin providing as assistance that is not certified nursing assistance. Uh, none of us can afford to, to pay uh, for those kind of services very long, but there are scaled down services that we can use. People might be able to help us dress and undress and fix our meals and, and so on. Those services, uh, to be available to people in the home will prevent folks from literally dying in nursing homes. Uh, you know, we've, we have evidence that shows somebody who moves into a nursing home, life expectancy on average is about three years. If that same person is cared for at home by family, friends, or community providers, their lifespan may be close to normal. So uh, there are some challenges and some real opportunities, Julia. I appreciate your tactical and really pragmatic suggestions um, because I think there's lots of allies and advocates on this call that like can be empowered to make a report to the EEOC or the DOJ. And I think that your points around our aging population um, is really important forecasting things that we should be thinking about. Allison, um, what gaps in the law needs to be addressed? What should local government or state legislations be, be doing to advance the civil rights for persons of, in, with disabilities? Where, where are the gaps at? What do we need to do? So I would say the primary place is sort of what we're doing right now, educating and becoming supporters and advocates. Um, as I say, I, I bring up that that example all the time about if you had a sign in the window that said for whites only and because it's controversial and people like what 
but it's so true. My daughter just got her first job, went down there to see her the first day of work, and it was a brand new building. And remember, the ADA was passed in 1990. Um, and I got there, and there was an upstairs, and I, and I said, oh, where's the, it was a food hall. I'm like, where's the elevator? She said, oh, they don't have it. And I said, why? And she said, well, I mean, because it's, I don't know. You know I mean, she's, it's her first job. She's 16, but, but everybody else, they can eat down here. And I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? She's like, mom, please, like, please stop. But I said, she said, please don't make a big deal. It's my first day. I'm like, that's fine. I'm just going to go put a sign up that says for whites only upstairs. No, no. I'm like, well, I mean, why are we saying it's only for people who can walk up the stairs? Right then a person in a wheelchair came in and I said, you know what? See, so it just, I think um, to, to start looking around and to make those complaints. So where, where's the problem in attitude and people saying, well, as long as they've got their space over here, that's okay. Um, I'm one of those people, people maybe don't like to take me to dinner because I do mention this all the time. I went to a restaurant and we were seated upstairs and I said, why don't, there's no elevator up here. And they're like, oh, well, they can go over there. And I said, well, what if we had walked in and they said, oh, you middle-aged white women, we've got a section for you right over here. This is where you sit. Like why we get to choose where we sit. Why don't we all understand that we should all get to choose, right? We don't have a space for people who have disabilities or a section for people who have disabilities. So I think our mindset is on compliance. What's the minimum that we have to do? And I think the biggest challenge for us is to get people to recognize we're not looking for the minimum. We're looking for full inclusion. We're looking for true acceptance. We're looking to be part. It's not us and them because one in five of us has a disability. And as we age, one in four of us has a disability. It's us. This is us. I mean, on this panel, this is us, right? So um, I think that's the biggest challenge. And until we start having that, um, somebody asked in the chat, why do we have to keep bringing these cases to enforce this 32-year-old law? It's because there's not enough pressure. People aren't complaining. People aren't speaking up. People aren't saying, this is a problem. We need to change this. And we and to do that, we people can and should file complaints federally. Um, lots of states have and should keep enacting state civil rights laws so that there's another mechanism for enforcement. And we should have more access to justice, free attorneys or low price attorneys who can bring these cases so that we start to get this pressure upon us so that just like we cringe if we see for whites only sign, we would cringe if we walked in and saw stairs. Compliance isn't inclusion. I, exactly. I say it louder, right, Allison? Yes. I, 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 I really appreciate that insight. Um, Lloyd, what work remains for allies? What are allies getting right? Where do allies need to grow in developing understanding? What's um, think? As I mentioned, the highest rate of unemployment uh, in America are people with disabilities. And I'm not talking 15, 10 to 15 percent like the Great Recession. I'm not talking... 25% like the Great Depression. I'm talking 50 to 80%. It is a national outrage. It should be on the front page of every newspaper every day. It should be the lead story in every website every day. As allies, we should be talking with our friends and neighbors. We should be talking with our community groups, with the organizations we belong to. I'm a proud member of the ADL. ADL, uh, I'm hoping we'll do a lot more in this arena. Uh, you know, there's a need for more legal, uh, you know, uh, initiatives. You know, someone in the chat box mentioned that they've had several interviews, but they're not getting jobs because of uh, uh, resistance to providing accommodation. If that's declared, that's a lawsuit. And I bet there's lots of undeclared uh, refusals to hire on that, that very basis, too. Uh, we should be reaching out to legislators. We should be talking to the businesses we frequent. Um, I, many years ago, was invited to be on an employment panel for disabilities at the World Down Syndrome Congress Convention uh, at the United Nations. And in my typical fashion, with everyone in the audience, I asked everybody, you know, uh, how many of the group, I mean, they'd all flown to New York and they were staying in New York from all around the world. How many were managers or had great access to their management? Almost everyone raised their hand. And the next question I asked was, how many of you people have hired someone with a disability? And very few hands went up. Uh, so I would also challenge the group uh, viewing this, this great 
this great, uh, you know, uh, call and conversation of, you know, consider hiring people with disabilities in your own organizations. Go to the people you work for, insist that they hire people with disabilities. As I mentioned, they're great contributors. They make a great deal of sense in a business sense, but it's also a civil right. And it's just very wrong to have this high rate of unemployment. So within our own spheres of influence, advocating for hiring people with disabilities is something that each of us could be doing, right? Um, Jennifer, I have the same question for you. What are allies and families getting right? What misconceptions or misunderstandings remain? What, what deserves most urgent focus right now? Well, I do think that we now have a new generation of young adults who have been through a time where they're used to inclusion um, and not segregation. And we've seen a lot of that in the last couple of years as we've seen, um, you know, some of our young adults who've gone to school with people with disabilities, gone to camp. And so, you know, they have become that next generation of allies. And so I think that piece is so important. And as we continue to make sure that inclusion is first and foremost, and we're moving in a direction that everyone should be able to do what they want to do and where they want to do it. I think that's going to be really, really helpful. And I have also seen them being allies and advocates and saying, we want to employ individuals with disabilities. We believe this is the right thing to do and that they know that individuals with disabilities um, offer a lot within um, their organizations and businesses and that they're not just looking at DEI um, and not looking at individuals with disabilities. So I think that's a huge piece and really, really a positive piece. Um, you know, I, I do still think that we are in a place where there's not enough community support um, for individuals, um, specifically individuals with intellectual disabilities. There's not day programs for them to go to, and there's not enough job coaches, and individuals with disabilities are not being given um, the same chances as others applying for jobs. And so I, I do believe that instead of, you know, it being a burden to make accommodations, it just should be what we do, that anyone walking to in the door um, needs different accommodations for different reasons. And so I think that's a piece that um, we are, we're not there yet. Um, I know a lot of our adults, especially after COVID, are still unemployed. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, there's not enough money um, to employ um, individuals with disabilities. And instead of us, you know, advocating for that everyone should be given the same opportunities um, and accommodations and that they're doing the same job as anyone else. Um, but that that's, I think, where we're still struggling um, is that piece and, and that support. And I do think it's that community support um, I know particularly here in Illinois, we're still struggling with a state um, that doesn't necessarily have um, the best um, financial support for individuals with disabilities. Um, we've seen a lot of that around housing individuals if they don't go into community arrangements, um, that it's hard for them to, you know, make money at a job and rent an apartment and all of those pieces. And so I think that is something we really need to focus a lot on um, and that accessibility and accommodate accommodations. Okay, we have tons of questions coming in from the chat. There's lots of interest and um, questions in this, but while, while we're talking about the hiring process, the, the question um, pops up, what risks do people with disabilities face who choose to disclose their disability in the hiring process or while on the job? Um, who wants, anybody wanna take that one out of the gate? Sure. Um, so, and I did employment law for many years. Uh, you don't have to disclose. Uh, the only question that an employer is allowed to ask is, can you perform the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation? They can't ask you what your reasonable accommodation is, um, but that's all they can ask. That's for folks that it's not obvious that you have a disability, right? Then there's going to be some people that it will just be obvious if you come rolling in or if you use a cane or if you need an interpreter in your job interview. So um, sometimes you, you know, it's, it's your disability is obvious. Um, interestingly, I guess the risk is that people won't want to hire you because of uh, 
perceptions or stereotypes they have. Um, the positive, however, is that if your disability is known, then you do have that possibility of saying you didn't hire me because of my disability. If you do not, if your disability is not obvious and you choose not to disclose it in the hiring process and you don't get hired, you, you can't claim it was because of your disability because they didn't know about it. So it's kind of a double edged sword. Um, you know, I, I think it's difficult. I was doing interviews. I was hiring somebody recently. I did end up hiring a person with a disability, but one of the other candidates was a blind candidate and the hiring folks um, said to me, well, we need to give him twice as long for any assessment. And I said, oh, did he ask for that? And they said, well, no, but he's blind. I was like, <laughs> what? So are we telling every hiring manager that blind people take twice as long to work? Or I mean, like, so I just think it's, um, it, it's a decision that you have to make on your own. You don't have protection unless you disclose, but you're not required to disclose. Let me, let me interject too here. For some people, it may be a strategy to voluntarily disclose. And to say, look, you know, I and I've been living with this disability and I can cope with it and I can deal with it and I have experience and I have practice. And if you hire me, these are the kinds of accommodations that I would expect and they will not be expensive and I can help you ensure that they are made in an efficient manner and, and I can do my job as well or better than anyone without a disability. Now, that's a different approach. But it also gives you the opportunity to express yourself to an employer in ways that most uh, people applying for a job might not choose to do. And it also gives you the opportunity to qualify for set aside spots the employer may have hiring people with disabilities and to meet their objectives in that regard. So there is a balance and one has to be thoughtful about the way they approach an employment opportunity. I totally agree. It's just that you have to make a personal decision. And I think that's a super point. Yeah, absolutely good point. It's going to vary. It's going to be very from person to person. Okay, lots of questions about um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. This person says, I'm seeing it described as the first civil rights law for persons with disabilities, and it prohibits discrimination on disability. Can you describe a little more about uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act? But Title V, I mean, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Title V, Sections 503 and 504, despite ADA, are still the predominant uh, disability rights legislation as it relates to employment. So ADA did not void 503 and 504. And in fact, uh, those uh, pieces of legislation have, uh, most attorneys would say, more power in the employment arena than the ADA does. ADA says you can't uh, discriminate and you may need to make reasonable accommodation. Uh, but uh, 503 and 504 go a bit further than that and actually require businesses to take affirmative action in some cases. That's helpful. Another I think the problem with the 504 is that it requires a federal, some sort of federal funding. So, so many places receive grants or government assistance, but if you're a completely private business with no federal funding, then, then you, you can't use that law. So but, but be aware that most businesses have federal funding somewhere or another. They may tell you, in fact, I had a university discriminate against me uh, in 1960 eight after the passage of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, they wrote and, and voluntarily admitted that they discriminated uh, because they claimed they did not have any federal funding. And uh, in fact, they had federal grants that helped build their, uh, uh, their dormitories. And, uh, and uh, later on in 1980 in Houston, when uh, entrepreneurs were building the sports arena, uh, they claimed they didn't have to be accessible because they didn't have any federal money. Well, it turns out that they had a lot of federal loans. And uh, so, you know, just beware that uh, most, most businesses, despite even perhaps the belief of the person you're consulting with, actually do have federal dollars behind their business. Yeah, I agree. And I think that a lot of times people bring both claims and so they can flesh it all out and right. have different... Um, access to damages too, so. 
I'm being asked to remind everyone that this program is being recorded and some of the links mentioned by our panelists today will be shared in an email that will go out tomorrow along with the recording to all registered participants. I have a question in for Lloyd. What is being done um, to address sub-minimum wages or low wages for people with disabilities? Well, fortunately, in many states, it's been eliminated. Uh, as we've done in Colorado, there's absolutely no need for sub-minimum wage. We have never paid sub-minimum at my company, nor would we ever. And, uh, you know, it needs to be eliminated nationally. Uh, there's just no justification for it. It's another form of discrimination. And uh, as I pointed out, my company has never been more successful as we've hired hundreds of people with disabilities and will continue to do so. I appreciate that insight, Lloyd. Another question in from the chat, why are schools still sometimes reluctant to offer 504 plans for students who maybe don't need IEPs? I think there's probably uh, a lot of reasons behind that, mostly financial. I think that they're uh, in situations where they know um, they're going to have to provide extra services or supports. And so a lot of schools are still reluctant um, and families are still fighting. And I don't think it's a big difference between an IEP and a 504 plan. Um, IEP may have a little bit more in depth with goals and all of those pieces, but a 504 plan, you're still um, needing to give accommodations and support. And I hear stories after stories of schools still fighting with families about giving 504 plans. And I do think that some of it's financial. Um, they don't want to provide those extra services or they feel like they need extra time. How are we going to do that? We have to have an extra person. So um, they're not so accommodating towards it. And we have to advocate as parents and as caregivers for our kids yeah. in school sometimes because we're like like Allison said earlier, we're like we're not always at a place where everybody's seeing the world through the, the same conscious lens. Um, yep. Um, all right. I think um, it's just about time to wrap up and close out. I might have time for one more question. Um, OK, this one's come in a couple of different ways. Where, where have there been gaps or, or um, uh, rooms for improvement as far as the ADA is concerned, specifically around uh, the status of enforcement? Uh, the, the, Jillian, the, the opportunities are everywhere. And I just beg people to, uh, to empower those of us with disabilities by joining us and finding opportunities to make complaints. And, and I, I, I want to underline a point that was made earlier by another speaker, and that is, it's not just the federal uh, agencies that you may need to complain to. It may be local authorities. Uh, building codes are likely violated if there are inaccessible facilities and buildings, public buildings in your community. Every a uh, public agency is required to have a, a, a compliance plan under the ADA, and most don't know where their plans are, much less have them. So it is, a, you know, it is a, a challenge for us all to ensure compliance with the ADA, and uh, we need everyone's help and partnership uh, to file these complaints and do so. I mean, don't tell me about it. Don't tell Allison or Lloyd about it, you know. File a dead gum complaint. It takes <laughs> it just takes a minute, okay? Well, actually, you should tell me if it's in the city and county of Denver because I can help on that. That's what I do. <laughs> um, but I absolutely agree. I think it's just understanding where to complain, how to complain, that it's important to complain. DOJ does get a lot of complaints, and so they can't fully do every one, but they will notice if a lot of people are complaining about Denver or Chicago or you know, Miami, then they're going to go out there and, and look at it. They've got a whole thing called Project Civic Access, and they go and they say, what is compliant? What is not? And they go to cities and do that. So there are ways to do it. And I think um, 
yeah, I mean, I wish the enforcement was stronger or easier, but it does exist and it exists at the local, state, federal level, several different federal agencies. I, I know we're going to send some information on it, but the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services was really big during COVID or in family court issues. Um, the U.S. Department of Education has an office for civil rights. There's lots of different places that you can bring these complaints. Um, and just to, and, and it's easy. You're not required to be an attorney to do it, and they purposely make it easy. Um, so just to have that empowerment and to urge others to, to do that. Julian, you probably remember your brother showing up in the place of business with his uh, EEOC ADA badge and looking at the <laughs> people's faces. I mean, seriously, I've been with the U.S. Attorney's Office when they've showed up at a restaurant carrying their measuring sticks and notepads, uh, wearing their... <laughs> it's like the SWAT team is moving in. These, <laughs> these complaints do uh, require... Uh, action and and federal authorities as well as state and local authorities that are responsible for for uh, the implementation will follow the uh, complaint patterns and will take action. It's important. Your voice matters. The rep the complaint is worth making. If you see something, say something. Right? Like that's uh, it takes an extra time, but it's making the world a more inclusive place. Is is what I'm hearing. Um, it's time, it, our time has come to a close. I just want to say that I have personally been honored to sit, um, sit among such wise advocates, and I really appreciate you spending your time with us today um, and empowering our listeners and viewers um, to, to recognize that compliance is an inclusion and that people with disabilities need, need to get employed. I feel like the, those, are, those are the takeaways, that, at least the top of mind for me right now, and I'll turn it over um, to Jeremy who's gonna to, to close us out for today. Thank you so much, Jillian. And on behalf of the ADL Central Division, we thank uh, Jennifer, Allison, Lloyd, Lex. We really appreciate the expertise and experience that you all shared. Uh, we will be sending out the recording and some of the mentioned resources in the next day or so for all those who registered. So uh, look for an email from us there. And um, we, again, we extend uh, a thanks to our uh, sponsor, American Airlines, and all those community partners that help spread the word about today's event. Um, we will look forward to staying in touch with you all, and thank you for tuning in today and spending part of your day with us. Thank you. This concludes today's program. Thank you very much for joining us.